Ellie is a consultant in public health and she's also associate director of public health in NHS side in Scotland and she has a remarkable career in uh, public health training and um, in terms of postgraduate training being the program director for public health in um, in Scotland and uh, as also in um, medical schools and undergraduate medica medicine teaching public health to medical students and uh, similarly Dr. Richard Pinder is a clinical senior lecturer at um, Imperial College London and uh, leads the undergraduate public health education unit in um, Imperial School of Public Health. He has been involved in different roles of uh, teaching public health and the global health and the lifestyle medicine, as well as the delivering models to the masters of public health at the Imperial College. So their perspectives and testimonies are certainly going to be useful for us to learn about um, how we can develop a and a career that is academic, but instead of being focused on research, is focusing focusing on education and uh, training. There will be plenty of time for uh, asking questions, as I think there will be many of us interested in uh, pursuing similar pathways that combine both or career paths that combine both. A service and um, teaching and education. So, without further ado, um, because women should always be first, I'll just pass on to Dr. Ellie Fothersall. Thank you. Thank you very much, and and thank you for inviting us to to speak today. Um, it's not often that people um, invite you to just come and talk about yourself. So uh, I, I'm enjoying the ego trip uh, and, and I'm not sure I've ever thought to describe my own career as remarkable before. So I'm enjoying that as well. Um, I, I'm afraid that I have a sufficiently short attention span that I needed to make myself some slides. Otherwise I'd forget how I was going to tell you the story of my own life, which reflects badly on me, I think, but here we are. Uh, so I'm just going to share my slides with you. And as is traditional, if someone could tell me if it looks all right, that would be great. Do you have the the cheat view with the preview down the side? No, it looks good. It has the preview. Yeah, it's fine. Um, I feel sure there's a way of changing it, but it'll take too long. So I was just going to tell you a little bit about myself and, and how I got here. So as mentioned, I, I'm Ellie Hothersall and um, my title at the moment is head of MBCHB in Dundee, but um, I will be shortly picking up the post of a head of the whole undergraduate school. Uh, and I'm an honorary consultant in public health. Addition, in addition to that, I used to be associate director of public health, but um, have stepped down from that in order to, to go back to spending more time in teaching. So I'm going to give you a very short outline of, of my career and how I got here. Um, I was hill walking with my daughter this weekend and it reminded me of how when you get to the top of the hill and you look back down, it all makes perfect sense. But as you're going up, there are a lot of false summits, a lot of potentially wrong turns and, and ways that we might have retrospectively made it all make sense, but it doesn't necessarily as you're going through it. So um, I'm going to outline some of the slog and some of the fantastic view and, and tell you where I think things are going from here. Uh, so first of all, I suppose, how did I get into public health? Um, my uh, background is um, I, I went to secondary school up in the Western Isles uh, in, in the far northwest of Scotland. And I've always had an interest in rurality, in the great outdoors, 
And um, despite that, I suppose, what, once I was old enough to, to go to university, I went back to the big smoke of Glasgow to do medicine. Um, and then was lucky enough to be able to do an intercalated BMSC, BSc rather, in medical anthropology at UCL during my studies. And that really reinforced for me the fact that my greatest interests are at the social end of medicine and, and that the, the social construction around how health and um, well-being is, is thought of is, is to me what, what really is the most interesting bit of what I was studying. And then after finishing uh, my degree, I was again lucky enough to, to land my first job and then my first SHO job in Shetland. So um, opportunities to work in small remote places uh, where person-centered care was a thing before anyone had given it that term and where um, teamwork and community were were really really key parts of of how how you did your job and I was hugely inspired while in Shetland by the director of public health there at the time who um I has since retired but but I, I stay in touch with and so I suppose when I started thinking about a career in public health I definitely thought that um I was either going to be the great white savior of the world who would be the first on every airplane going to every uh, outbreak of exotic diseases you know in far flung remote wildly beautiful but hugely needy um parts of the world I, I fully acknowledge how ridiculously childish my brain was um or I was going to be director of public health on a beautiful island like Shetland um but as you can see megalomania has paid played a, a part in my career ambitions for a long time um I then got into having done um those jobs I started thinking how I might refine my CV so that I looked like the kind of person who would be accepted onto a public health training scheme. So um, first I, I took some a &E jobs and that was, you know, back to my um, savior complex thing. I thought I better need, know how to, to fix a broken leg in the middle of the jungle. How I thought I was going to learn that in Stoke on Trent, I do not know, but uh, I did. Um, and what I learned from that is that I don't actually ever want to be the person in charge of a massive mass casualty event or anything similar. Um, and then I, on the basis of advice from lots of people, um, I, I thought that it would be sensible to get experience of research and, and took up an, a post which turned into doing an MD at University of Glasgow. Um, then Whilst in that post, uh, I got the training position in the West Midlands and moved down there and fitted all of those life events that people do in. So do the master's in public health, finish my MD, do all the exams, have a couple of kids, all of those things. Um, and in the last year of the training scheme, I also became an NIHR clinical lecturer and was on the leadership program that they were running at that time, which is where I encountered this word serendipity. But when, when, when the, the seniors who came to speak to us on that course talked about their careers, they used this word a lot, about how you're lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time when things happen. And that very much felt like a resonant description of, of where I am. So I'm telling you about my career, but I'm, I'm trying to acknowledge that some of it's about luck. Some of it's about being in the right place at the right time. And, and I was trying to find an image to describe this sort of wandering off the main path. I kept doing things that other people thought was unusual to be doing. Um, and if you type phrases like that into Google, all you get are these wonderfully inspiring quotes. So this is Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, and I think it can be interesting and inspiring to take the road less traveled and to leave a trail, but actually it can also feel perpetually like you're doing the wrong thing or that, that you know, your life would have been easier and more predictable if only you'd done whatever felt like the, the more common thing. Um, but if it doesn't make you happy, then there isn't any point. 
And then the world shifted. Um, I mean, I know it's shifted many times since, but this this particular storm cloud here refers to the general election of 2009, 2010, whenever that was, um, when the uh, English public appeared to decide to vote for the systematic dismantling of the NHS and public health as we knew it in England. And I was just coming to the end of my training scheme and my husband was now qualified as a GP. So we uh, applied for every job we could see in Scotland in hopes of, of getting away from the cataclysm uh, before it happened and, and ran back north to, to Scotland. And we're fortunate enough to both get jobs starting in Dundee on the same day. Um, which I like to pretend was due to my immense and intricate planning uh, abilities and definitely was not luck in any way, shape or form. We, um, when I first got here, I was employed on a 50-50 teaching and research post at the university doing um, public health teaching and um, in a really interesting big data project looking at, at diabetes, use, making use of the massive data sets that, that we have here in Scotland uh, for diabetes epidemiology. Um, however, I came to realise that my, despite having done lots of bits of research through the years, that, that my energy does not come from research. And so after a couple of years, I had shifted into a role which was NHS uh, and teaching and then my teaching got bigger and bigger and bigger and my commitment to the NHS has, has got smaller over time um, and then the pandemic came along and um, I, like everybody else that was somewhat disruptive and so I actually had a nine months comment full time to public health because whilst it felt to me like there were other people who could pick up medical education responsibilities. There really weren't that many folk around who could pick up public health responsibilities. Um, and so since then I've, I've gone back and I'm now back to being eight sessions of teaching and three of, of NHS, um, which for me is a lovely balance. But, um, but this bit, you know, the pandemic was such a huge disruption for everybody and, and brought a whole load of things into focus perhaps that wouldn't have done. When I was preparing this slide, I was thinking about um, other ways that this bit of my life kind of has been shaped. So when I came up, I was on a clinical lecturer role. So I got my CCT, but um, but the role I, I walked into straight away was clinical lecturer. And then shortly afterwards, I actually obtained a consultant post and became about the same time the head of teaching for years one to three in our MBCHB curriculum. And then five years ago, go now, I became the head of the MBC programme. And so you can see that, that being head of programme takes up quite a lot of, of your time. And then somewhere in there, I managed to squeeze in uh, another degree. So I did a master's in medical education because it felt to me that if I wanted that to be my the, the bigger bit of my career, I needed some letters after my name that matched that bit. Um, and I focused on assessment because I am, as colleagues who have met me before may know, I'm slightly obsessed with how we can assess not just public health, but other contextual topics in a way which is robust enough that it will be accepted into the broader medical education world where they're very um concrete they they really only are interested in objective measures that can be defended when you get a lawyer trying to appeal against it which is completely understandable but quite difficult when you know you're trying to tease out different social determinants of health for example um and and probably in some ways my luckiest move ever has been to get heavily involved with the medical schools council assessment alliance so 10 years ago now i sort of got my elbows out and said you guys know nothing about assessing public health or sociology or psychology how about i come and tell you how to do it um i've never yet successfully told them how to do it but i'm uh, they do give me plenty of time and, and we get a lot of, of discussion about it um, and i now have quite a significant role in the implementation of this new national exam which is coming in next year so now this is meant to be a really um 
I don't know. It's not meant to be. It's, it's meant to be a really exciting slide that tries to tell you what it is that I do all day now. Uh, but there is no way of presenting that that doesn't look incredibly dull. So I do apologise. But um, I am currently in my role with the, the head of the MCHB programme. We have run a large curriculum review. It was slightly in hiatus during COVID, but has come back very successfully since. Where we're trying to help our students to get the social purpose side of medicine to try and help them to understand the bigger picture whilst at the same time having this pressure that we need to make sure that our students are going to do as well as they possibly can in these new national exams. Those are interesting tensions but I think that it is possible to resolve it in a way that makes a well-rounded doctor. Um, we're very involved in educational research. I'm particularly interested in what the increase in widening participation is doing, both for um, medicine, but also what it's doing to those students who are brought in, who are not from non-traditional backgrounds, because I don't think we look after them very well. I'm still really interested in what happens with assessment. Um, I'm also very involved in the teaching and assessing of professionalism and sadly frequently involved in the formal side when students have been less than professional. Um, as I shift into this new role as head of school, we're going to be looking more at how science is taught across the whole school. So where basic science is taught, what is relevant of basic science. I have this sneaking suspicion that um, in medicine, I'm certain we teach too much stuff to students, and I suspect that what we are doing too much of now is teaching more basic science than we really need, but it's extremely hard to get anybody to ever admit that their bit could possibly be less important. Um, I think it's important that we look at student support, and at the moment in our school, it feels like we've been able to throw money and energy at medical students but we have several hundred non-medical students um, and, and I would like to make sure that we're offering them the right things. I want to bring scholarship more widely into our education team because Dundee used to be very famous for its medical education and now is moderately famous for its medical education and I'd like to make Dundee great again but without any walls. Um, and finally we're quite involved in quality assurance for other programs and schools and involved in working across the world trying to bring the great shining light that is what we do elsewhere. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the MLA, this new exit exam is coming in and, and so I'll continue to be heavily involved in that for many, many years to come, I think. So I've, I've rattled through that because, as I say, talking about yourself is kind of weird, but I just wanted to finish with a little bit about what I think is changing in this field, thinking particularly about the education side, because that's my interest. So um, if you went to medical school more than 10 years ago, um, it, they, it did, really didn't matter in some ways where you went. Everywhere had a remarkably similar system. And in some ways, they still do, but the emphasis has shifted. And what we're seeing across the globe is this gradual increase in an emphasis on what in the UK, which is your diagram on the left of your screen, they're calling the professional values and behaviours dimension. So that's looking at all sorts of the, the skills in medicine that are not how many things you have memorized and how good you are at feeling for splenomegaly. And it's, it's a lot more of the skills which are, um, I suppose, transferable. And I'll, I'll come back to that because actually I think that flexibility is really important. But your diagram on the, the right there, this is the Canadian framework, which actually has an awful lot of these same skills being identified as being important and gradually curricula across the world are shifting to emphasize this but it is definitely a, a culture change um, and, and there are still plenty of places in the world and plenty of places in every medical school in the UK where there's a really strong em emphasis still on lots and lots of fact learning and, and my argument is that that is probably becoming increasingly redundant. I think as things change in the future, we are seeing things like the way the AI is changing education is shifting the 
it's not just shifting the goalposts, it's shifting the entire playing field so rapidly that academics are struggling to keep up. And I, and I think it's really important that we think about how medicine is going to change be, as, um, as part of our social system so that we are, are able to adapt to that in the future. Whilst meantime, we, you know, we may not be out of pandemic season just yet. Um, we're seeing changes from climate change and political upheaval, which mean that we are likely to see demographic shift and transitions that we need to be able to train doctors and healthcare professionals in the broadest sense of the future to adapt to. And so I think that means we need to change our curriculum. We need to be emphasizing values, communication skills, creating supportive environments far more than we ever did before. When I was a student, we thought the communication skills was something you did a one afternoon session on in third year. And now my students spend one afternoon a week doing communication skills for the first three years of the curriculum. We can teach communication skills. I'm certain we can teach how to make people feel safer. We can teach how to respect equality and diversity in a way which actually is meaningful for people and is not just some horrendous online module. And I think we can encourage things like re reflective practice and curiosity so that people stay adaptable into the future. And this is my final thought. I've used this slide loads, so if anyone is unfortunate enough to have seen it before, I do apologise. But um, last year, there was a big story about how the Lensa AI app took photographs of you and made them beautiful. Only what they really did was they made everyone look a bit generic and a bit thinner and a bit whiter and, and everything else. And obviously, I'm incredibly vain. So having heard that it was going to make me beautiful, uploaded my pictures, paid my five pounds, got my photos. So this is one of the pictures uh, that I, I got. And it, you can probably see the real picture of me on the right at the moment and the AI generated one. And I, I imagine you might agree it has made me a little more beautiful. Um, but but when you look at these more closely, I'm going to invite you to, to zero in there on the glasses. And what you can see is that for the vast majority of pictures that the AI produced where I am wearing glasses, interestingly, it edited them out quite often. But when it gives me glasses, they're often merging with my face. So you can see the way that, that my absolutely fabulous um, eyeliner, I do not do fabulous eyeliner, um, and the glasses, they, they merge together. And so the argument I keep making is that for as long as AI can't tell the difference between hardware and software, hardware and flesh, there's probably still a place for us. But I think it's really important that in medicine and public health and the healthcare system as a whole, we think about what that's going to mean and we help the students to get back to what I'm actually meant to be talking about, we help the students to, to, to anticipate some of this and to be adaptable and to work to be adaptable in a way that is going to let them still be able to do things that they want to do in the future. And that is me, so I shall stop sharing. I don't know if that's temporarily away, but um, I think the plan is to go straight on to Richard and then have Q&A at the end. That's probably the best use of time. Thank you very much, Ellie. That was brilliant. OK, well, good morning, everyone. And it's um, lovely to see you. And Ellie, it's so fascinating. I've never heard all of that before. And I think um, in some ways I'm going to be we've actually got very similar paths, although I'm slightly further down the mountain, I think, than you. But congratulations on the new role as head of school. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted um, to hear that. It's good to have public health people um, in these roles. So um, when I was kind of asked to do this, um, just like Ellie, it's kind of pretty weird to be asked to talk about your career. And actually, when I was when I was writing the slides yesterday morning, I kind of felt this was all, it sounded like I'd sort of got somewhere and that this was the career. And I, I, I'm not convinced this is my career. So I've added in the word so far, at least, um, in terms of a career in public health education. Um, but I think probably the overwhelming um, thing you might take away from the session is definitely not to not to do what I've done. Probably um, Ellie, I think, has been a lot more considered in all of this. We've ended up probably in relatively similar positions, albeit I'm, I'm, I'm several years behind. Uh, but certainly none of this was planned, I think, is the, um, the theme I will I will give to you. 
So um, it's amazing how much our slides are also very similar because we haven't communicated um, about this either. I would just sort of give you my background. Um, I started off um, at med school over at GKT, graduated in 2008. Um, I did a BSc in radiological science, so that's kind of computational imaging and medical physics. Um, no medical education experience, certainly, um, there. I then moved on to um, AFP, what's now SFP, did military health and epidemiological psychiatry. Um, and I think the only real training I had was the two day teaching the teacher course at St. Thomas's, where um, I had to explain, I can't remember what I had to explain, it's in that logo design in the London 2012 Olympics. I think that was the, the, the uh, apotheosis of the two day course. Um, and I then uh, went on to public health. And unlike Ellie, um, I only discovered public health was actually a specialty two weeks before I applied for the job. And, um, and, and that year, it was so competitive in London back in 2009, 2010. Uh, there were five ACF posts, and they only appointed two of us. So they literally couldn't fill um, the job. So, so all of kind of, I guess, where I am has been kind of this um, serendipity would be the polite way of putting it. Uh, but it's probably rather more chaotic um, than that. I uh, spent a bit of time in, in, in Lewisham in southeast London, uh, frustrated with the geography of London, placing me in a northwest London university in a southeast London um, place. And I did my MPH in 2011, and I got my MFPH in 2013. Um, I took up my first consultant role in 2015 in Southwark, so that's also in southeast London. But what it sort of dawned on me was that there is this sort of like gap somewhere in the middle that probably is where the, the education kind of came from, but which, if you were actually really looking at my CV, probably isn't terribly clear. Um, but I've never really had a plan. I It was always kind of like, well, I'll apply for public health. If I hadn't gotten into public health, I, I would probably... Um, have gone off into the private sector would have been my suspicion. Um, I've fallen out of love with public health multiple times over the training program. So I went off and spent a couple of years in pharma. Um, but but it's been it, it's been really, really enjoyable. And I, I'm back here um, for um, a reason that I can tell you a bit, little bit about later. So I had a fairly generic kind of um, time through training, um, did lots of just random, interesting stuff. And I've always been one of those people, I think what Ellie said around kind of, um, you know, the the uh, the fact that you just happen to be there at the right moment, I think, is actually a huge amount of where I've ended up. I'd always been interested in kind of education. I'd always been interested in career development. And I think having gone through public health training, what I'd reflected on was that, um, you know, you get a lot of F2s, a lot of medical students coming up and asking, well, um, you know, what's public health like? And, and those are actually really therapeutic moments. They're times where you actually really have to think about how on earth are you where you are today? Um, and on the back of that, I think what I concluded was that public health was really badly taught and signposted at medical school. Um, and, you know, when I ended up in public health, the the, the big thing I sort of realized uh, once I sort of came into the training scheme was actually so much of the stuff I'd been doing all the way through medical school, the lectures I'd found interesting, my elective, all of these different things were actually all public health, but I just never really pieced it together before because I didn't really understand what this whole public health thing was. So um, in terms of education, I look back, well, I, I was invited to sort of support a mini MPH that they were developing at King's Health Partners back in, in 2013. Um, in the pharma sector, I'd also been doing quite a lot of the sort of medical affairs, um, kind of pharmaceutical education type stuff. So again, there'd been sort of this idea that how do we communicate sort of relatively complex research topics to frontline clinicians, I can tell you, um, bizarrely unhelpful amounts about a couple of specific drugs that were kind of my specialty area, uh, which has been totally unhelpful knowledge ever since, um, but something that I, I sort of do when I see it in the newspapers or see a paper, I get quite excited. Um, and then basically there was this sort of um, lecturer from Imperial who had taught me on my MPH, who approached me um, probably in about 2012, 2013 to say they were developing this new online Masters of Public Health program at the University of Hertfordshire. Um, which is actually just about five or six miles away, I think, from where I now live. Um, but that was in 2013, and we started the build of that programme in 2014. 
Um, and I think my experience on that was that I would never dabble in online education again, because in spite of my um, best estimates of how long it would take to design this epidemiology and biostatistics um, module, uh, it took uh, just unearthly amounts of time. I ended up having to buy my wife a cat that year because uh, I was literally just stuck in the study um, the entire summer trying to record these lectures and do all this sort of digital stuff. So that kind of really, I guess, it was, it was satisfying, it was interesting, but it did put me off a little. Um, but then when I CCT'd, they were looking, um, we had this sort of challenge at Imperial around, we had this thing called an MPH. Um, I know this is being recorded, or is it not being recorded? I know. Um, but I think in all fairness, I think we were broadly teaching an MSc in public health sciences. So we didn't really have that applied edge or that angle. And so I was asked, um, invited to come in and sort of, um, you know, what would you do to make the MPH as it stands a little bit more applied. And I think that's what sort of got me more into the imperial um, sort of system. And obviously, um, if you looked at that previous timeline, uh, I'm teaching, I'm speaking to a room full of academics or sort of um, aspirational academics. Um, I don't have a PhD, which is um, pretty dodgy. I was definitely a failed ACF on that front. Uh, but that is definitely something that, um, you know, certainly uh, now as a sort of a more senior academic, um, I do have to sort of keep a little bit quiet around the fact I'm not really qualified in any meaningful way. Um, to take on the job. But basically towards um, sort of 2018, 2019, after I'd been, um, I'd sort of picked up as a, as a consultant, I'd picked up one academic session um, at Imperial, another academic session at Hertfordshire on top of my sort of day job as a, as a jobbing public health consultant in local government. Um, and um, it sort of built from there. So actually it's very similar, I think, to Ellie in terms of you kind of pick up a bit of stuff and then it sort of um, gets bigger and then it becomes formalized. So, um, you know, I started off with um, educational supervision stuff and postgraduate. So that was kind of something I picked up as a new consultant. I then sort of picked up, um, you know, building this new module at Imperial that was kind of then officially formalized. I then had sort of random PBL, problem-based learning and sort of medical student duties. Um, and this is actually a couple of photographs I'm really proud of. So this was me back just, I think I'd started as a consultant. And these are my duties at the opening dinner of the medical school um, journey in 20, I don't know, 2016, something like that. Uh, and then here's me with one of the students graduating um, just last year. So it, that's actually a really nice part of that educational part of what we do in terms of seeing people progress. And I always think this kind of harkens back to, um, you know, I still miss seeing patients. That's one thing I do miss having given up the kind of the conventional clinical career. And I think actually working with young people um, is it kind of makes up for that sort of human contact aspect of, you know, whilst I love the analysis, I love the things and the detail of public health, that human um, bit sometimes is um, a little bit missing in terms of what I like to do. Um, but we sort of, you know, picked up various bits of MPH. And then in 2017, 2018, all, all medical schools have this role, I think, pretty much as director of primary care teaching. And our director of primary care at Imperial, I think, was growing increasingly uncomfortable that she was meant to be leading some of the population health agenda. But actually, it wasn't really something she felt very confident with. And so she said, actually, I think this, this bit of my remit could go to someone else. And so what I'm still not sure about is whether I was tricked into applying for this post or um, it kind of whether was it creatively, was it not? But it was advertised just to sort of reassure everyone. Um, but they wanted someone to come in and develop the population health agenda into the medical school curriculum as part of this big curriculum review, uh, a phrase that um, certainly scares me still, Ellie. Uh, and it's been with us for the last several years. But this idea of can you lead population health, um, as we call it, into the medical school curriculum? So at that point, I think, I was I was woefully underqualified um, because one of the job uh, description criteria, this over person spec criteria, was something like um, deep experience or something of undergraduate education. And the only thing I could come up with was that I had led two PBL sessions five years previously for some of the second year medical students. So it was a little bit of a um, of, of a jump, but I had been doing quite a lot of postgraduate stuff by that point. So there was at least some sort of educational capability. Um, even if there wasn't much educational qualification. So that's kind of um, where it started. So um, what do I do now? Well, I think one of the challenges, what I would love to have done would have been to be better able to balance a service role with the educational role. 
Um, but it's very, very difficult to do both jobs well because the nature of the service role sucks you into the political issues, the budgetary issues. Um, it sort of takes up every single um, you know, bit of oxygen that you have. And the academic side will generally sort of go um, uh, wanting. And so for how many years was it? It was about three or four years. I sort of had this split of being um, sort of 10, 10 sessions service, two sessions um, academic. And 2018, they sort of, I had this sort of discussion with my boss at the time. He wasn't very keen on me sort of going down to sort of six academic sessions and then four um, service sessions. But it got very difficult. And basically, in the end, they decided to create a sort of a slightly larger scope of work on the academic side. And then I sort of moved down to two service sessions. Um, but that, that was a loss. That, that's a real sense of kind of identity and purpose, which I think is the challenge. Um, but what I started off with was this idea of how do we put population health into the medical school curriculum? And that was something I felt quite passionately about, because I thought there's so much that I wasn't taught at medical school that I wish I'd known, skills that we can take from public health, from public policy, and I think is kind of a core baseline level of understanding for medical students, having sat in so many CCG meetings as they were, looking around the room, looking at fantastic, fantastically qualified, capable and passionate um, GPs and secondary care physicians, but realising that actually they'd never really been grounded in any of the sort of fundamental issues that I would say are core to a physician's identity, whatever a physician's identity is, and we can talk about that, I'm sure, a little bit later on. But I came in with a population health hat on uh, with that agenda, and um, they'd, they'd kind of invented this, this module called lifestyle medicine, and um, I kind of had no idea what they were talking about. Um, but the kind of the, the origin of it had been um, anyone who's involved, if you, any of you are involved in education, what you probably will have observed is that there are very, very high levels of mental health issues, anxiety um, affecting younger people, not just from the pandemic, but preceding that. And what Imperial wanted to do was to basically deliver a welfare module was what I at least inferred from what they were asking. Um, but they didn't have anyone to run it because uh, there just wasn't anyone around and no one really understood, I think, what lifestyle medicine was. But our head of phase was um, sleep physiologists. So there was definitely something about sleep. There was definitely something about mental health. There was this kind of um, interest in financial um, sustainability as well, which was also quite sort of strange. And they sort of pieced this together into this idea of lifestyle medicine. And the deal I did was because I needed to get population health into the curriculum. The deal I did was I said, well, OK, I will take on lifestyle medicine if you call it lifestyle medicine and prevention. And then I will be able to negotiate very hard with myself and put loads of public health into the curriculum. I didn't tell them that, but I said, well, I would pick up the lifestyle medicine um, bit. So, so that's where we are on sort of this idea of lifestyle medicine and prevention. And I'm really proud because we're now 20% of the first two years of the program just doing lifestyle medicine and prevention. So I can look at our medical students now in third and fourth year and even now fifth year for the first year um, and say, so actually, they really do understand um, much of that sort of core public health, social determinants curriculum. And it's, you know, and, and they don't even notice it because it is just it's just first nature to all of them. They don't know anything different. So that's been really good fun. Um, I also run the Global Health Programme, which is one of the intercalated pathways. So we have between about sort of 25 and 40 students on that each year. Um, that That's a real challenge now. So for those of you who are from medical backgrounds, um, you'll be aware that intercalated degrees used to be part of the FPAS, the Foundation and Programme Application System, and in, into later core and specialty training. That's now being removed. So this whole um, existential dilemma we're in around what is the value of research and what are the scholarship skills needed to be a doctor is, 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 is less clear than I think it was because of the challenge and the pushback that we have on a six-year degree programme, which is obviously more expensive potentially hinders widening participation. Um, and also then on the other side, the challenge from the emergence of apprenticeship, um, medical schools and the like. I'm still delivering my MPH modules. So we have a, an on-campus and we have a, an online programme and that's kind of basically the, the part A curriculum. Um, but that, that, that's that been really good fun as well. And I spent actually for the first two years since I was in post before being sort of seconded back in, just like Ellie has been uh, for the pandemic, back into sort of frontline public health. Um, I probably spent more time in the studio um, recording um, sessions than I did um, actually in front of students. So again, it's been really interesting sort of doing that media development, um, learning a very different set of skills. Um, but now what do I do? Well, I'm now deputy head of year, at least for the next um, five weeks. I'm still deputy head of year for the first two years of the medical school. So I've got about 720 students that I deal with there. 
Um, and I'd say actually the frustrating part of my job is that most of my job is now management and leadership rather than actual teaching. And I think the moments I really do enjoy in each week, um, I love my job, so please don't think anything otherwise. But I think the moments that you sort of get that spark of actually that was a really good fun couple of hours is when you're actually in the classroom dealing with the students, not necessarily sitting in meetings, doing job interviews and balancing budgets. So um, I started off with a team, there were just two of us um, running the Global Health Programme. We're now um, across my team, uh, there's about 15 of us um, who run uh, public health and the professional um, values and behaviours. Uh, domains, lifestyle medicine, uh, global health and population health. I'm also responsible for about 10 GP um, tutors. That's also been quite interesting in terms of it becoming increasingly multidisciplinary. We're going to, we've got a nurse um, PhD student who's going to be joining us from August, which will be good fun. Um, but it's really nice just working with really passionate, capable, um, you know, smart people. And I think that's the really nice thing about working in a university. Um, you know, I've worked in fantastic public health teams. Do not get me wrong. I'm not criticizing local government. But I think outside the public health team, it can be slightly more uh, challenging to sort of um, get that sense of motivation and ambition sometimes, depending on what organization you're in. So actually, some of you may know if you're in the uh, south southeast um uh, not deanery uh thing that used to be he um Nalima is one of our she's an st4 public health registrar she's joined us for a year out of program this year uh, and that's molly and chris who are who are also part of the team now one of the things I'm, I'm always keen to show off is kind of the different set of skills that you develop and this was kind of one of the most anxiety provoking projects i worked on so this was for lifestyle medicine and prevention um I, you, sh you won't be able to hear anything, but this is one of the videos that we've um, developed as part of the lifestyle medicine and prevention um, curriculum. So we sort of take these archetypes and we follow them in this kind of mini documentary style. Um, and this is Priya, who's uh, one of the, the, the chief protagonists in this. We follow sort of two archetypes. Uh, Priya, who's this sort of young 20 something, relatively affluent um, young lady. Uh, and we also have our slightly more blue collar um, chap who's the traditional medical school kind of bill who eats too many burgers it's slightly more nuanced than that in our version um, but here's Pri uh, Priya and um, what the students don't know until the last episode of the final year is that she's actually a doctor and that's one of the ways that we try to communicate this idea of a constellation of subclinical risk factors um, and try and do some of this sort of lifestyle medicine teaching this idea that we look at other people we reflect it on ourselves and then we try to understand what the clinical implications are on that and that was um this series of videos that we've done has been really fascinating working with some of the creatives um going out on location shooting stuff um i feature as an easter egg in some of these on um, the back of my head at least um sitting in some of these episodes so that's been really good fun and um you know as an example of stuff that I think you probably wouldn't do in most other public health settings outside maybe a, um, a major a major comms um, initiative oops so um, what else do I do well it is kind of mostly management and leadership um, here's um, a lady called Saima from Egypt on the left hand side who I met at a conference a few months back um, and she came up to me and she goes oh Dr Pinder you won't know me um, but I'm a medical student from Egypt and I was like okay um, strange how you kind of either can read my badge very well or you seem to know me quite well. Um, but Saima had been doing my online program on the Coursera platform. And we have about sort of 10, 15,000 people who do this each year. And this is a program for those of you on the London scheme, if you know Talia Bashari uh, and a new, newly appointed consultant, Carolyn Sharp over in Hackney. Um, we built that um, master's program online. And actually a lot of the world can now do most of that learning for free on Coursera, which is um, really nice. And so that's the first time anyone has sort of approached me and said um, she knew me very well because uh, she'd sat with me for many hours um, listening to me drone on in these YouTube videos. Um, but that, that was really nice. Um, recruiting students is another big thing we do. Um, for some reason, we can't iron those um, those tablecloths. Uh, so I put it small enough that you can't see all of the creases, but that upsets me. Um, but then also the kind of the outward facing stuff. This is me with my, my two boys. Um, at the sort of STEM science outreach day um, last year. And again, it's really nice being in that environment in a university um, and doing stuff that actually you can kind of, you know, show people and show that sort of application to community engagement and all the rest of it and trying to take a lot of that um, sort of public health um, learning. So um, my final slide, um, what do I think are the, the opportunities and challenges in, um, if we call it public health education or, or medical education? I think it's interesting, both Ellie and I have ended up sort of starting off in public health education. We sort of transitioned perhaps a little bit more into, in, into medical education. I think that speaks a little bit to the challenge of 
um, it's not easy to fill up an entire consultant job plan on public health education alone, although I'm trying. Um, and the, the opportunities, I'd say, it's usually flexible. You can pick up your personal interests and a university environment is fantastic in terms of um, just being able to do stuff and get stuff done. There isn't the bureaucracy. There isn't the sign off. You can just get stuff done. I have a fantastic boss who just lets me do my job. And um, that is that is a fantastic um, feeling. I'm very lucky. I don't actually have a research um, uh, part of my job plan. So although I do research, I supervise um, projects and sort of randomly get involved in stuff. I don't have a requirement to bring in grant funding, which is, is really nice. Um, you can build and shape stuff. I like building stuff. What, I, what I've learned about myself is that I like building things. I don't like running things very much, but the idea of building something is, is really exciting. Um, and I think the other thing that I found interesting, which I didn't think I would expect um, to enjoy, is that it goes from being that sort of local uh, thing that you do in local authority to being something very global and international and I think that's been an area that I've actually really enjoyed um, you know you get some really just random interesting meetings where you get to meet people from halfway across the world and discover they're so much more competent in public health than we are uh, because their circumstances demand it um, you know they've got to do their vaccination right they've got to do all this because they don't have the resources that our, our fragile NHS uh, potentially does have what are the challenges? Um, so I'd say uh, progression is, is a challenge. So if you're on the learning and teaching side, I'm very fortunate I'm on an academic contract. I'm not on a, a learning and teaching contract, but it's very difficult for me to progress on the academic side without the research income. And learning and teaching is lower prestige than research, um, certainly at my university. I, I, I suspect it's similar in others. So that idea of, you know, where do you go next, I think is a big challenge. Seniority increasingly takes you away from the actual teaching and engagement side, and, and, and that's a frustration for me. Um, I don't really want to just do management. I don't want to do operational management and strategy exclusively. So creating that balance um, is a challenge. And, and, and building into that, the balancing thing is also between the sort of idea of, you know, I'm doing a PG dip this year. I, I'm probably going to have to do my MED next year to make up for the fact that I'm not qualified uh, for the job that I have. But that's sort of balancing the commitment between uh, being an educationalist, which I, I still don't really identify as, I think, um, the idea of specialty interest in terms of public health versus general medical training, and then also doing a bit of research and sort of fulfilling your academic contract um, is, is a real challenge in terms of well, where do you go? And, and there's standard tendency that you sort of go off and you fight the fires rather than do um, the strategic work, which I think is the challenge. Um, more, more jokingly, I guess, I love not having a public sector laptop. That is a great, um, that is a great uh, thing for me. I can bring my own device. So I'd say that's a real upside to working in a uh, university. A much lower level of bureaucracy um, is, is, is really nice as well. Although that can actually sometimes feel a little bit worrying and anxiety provoking, having come from a government type role. Um, but I still miss doing proper public health work. And I think that balance of actually kind of having stuff that you do, whether it's an evaluation or a needs assessment, I still miss that. And that's actually one of the things I'm trying to sort of develop a little bit more, at least in a private capacity at the moment. But the public health operational and management skills are really valuable in educational leadership. And I think that's an area where we have a lot to add um, in terms of just how you get things done and how you organize things, which if you're a sort of traditional conventional clinician, um, they don't really do because they just don't get the training or the opportunity unless they're sort of CMO um, as a medical director type level. That's it, I think. Oh, sorry, no, three other things, just very quickly. Uh, you can see I didn't practice this. Um, do you consider a PG cert? If you're sort of training at the moment, um, I think that is increasingly becoming a kind of like an entry criterion, much as I dislike it. But certainly when I'm shortlisting now, I do have to take PG cert, or at least FHEA as being a minimum. Um, networking and getting onto people's radars, I think is really useful. So just reach out, send a CV, um, come in and do some teaching. You don't want to be exploited, but um, I think it is quite normal to sort of give up a bit of time and do a bit of teaching and at least um, buy things in. And then um, I think enthusiasm speaks a lot. Um, the ability to, to engage, be flexible um, is also a key skill. So, so that's it and I'll stop there, sorry. So thanks a lot for the inspiring careers and I definitely agree with the fact that education and teaching is seen as lower prestige than research. That's very sad and I think disappointing because the outcome of 
education and teaching is a lot more guaranteed, I would say, than research. Being someone who does a lot of research, but uh, I think it's a, a huge commitment to the next generation. So we would really welcome any questions from the attendees, if there are any people who want to volunteer questions. Maybe while people are, are thinking of questions, I was just going to make a comment about that. Um, the, the, it, it is really interesting that um, the teaching has, you know, teaching has always been a lower prestige activity. Um, you know, school teachers are not highly valued either, um, but some institutions are really working to improve that um, and things like the teaching excellence framework. I think will will bring changes. Um, um, Dundee have appointed this year. They appointed three new pro professors on teaching and scholarship contracts in the university, which doubled the number um, that, that, that were in the whole institution. Which you know is in its it's sort of simultaneously depressing and cheering, depending on how you want. Glass half full, glass half empty. I think. Rebecca says that she has lost. Rebecca, do you want to unmute and ask? Sorry, I, my my thing at the bottom's all gone wrong, so I thought it's easy to just put it in there. So it is just picking up on what you've already said. Um, if that's okay, I wouldn't mind exploring it a little bit more. I am um, just to set a bit of context. I guess I've had quite a varied late entry to get where I am now. I like did medicine as a graduate entrant. This is my second specialty in medicine as well. Um, I'm an ST5 in public health now, but have had the opportunity to do lots of um, quite reasonable responsibility things in medical education, I think in assessment, uh, curriculum design and um, tutor roles, recruitment and so on. But I, I've done little bits of research, but nothing like a PhD. Um, and it is frustrating, certainly the institution I'm at, there is this perception as well. And it feels very much like, despite everything that I've done without being too, you know, I've done all these things in my dead, but that it will still be luck if I can get something, a more formal role in the institution because I haven't got a PhD. Um, and I don't really want to go and do a PhD now because I feel like I want to get on with what I'm doing. Um, so I'm glad, I guess, with what Ellie just said, that things are changing in some places. I guess that's nice to hear. Um, and I guess part of my thing was before Richard said he hadn't got a PhD, I was like, is there any chance? So there is a chance, <laughs> but we'll see. But I guess it was more... Is there, is it just look for where we are now, try maybe different institutions, or is there anything else that you can do to sort of make up this hole in research? Or would you say, even Richard particularly, do you wish you had done that just to have, I think it's really sad, but that you feel that you've got more um, on paper that you should be in these positions you're in? Because I don't see why doing a PhD in research should give you more authority to be a better medical educator but that was sort of what you were suggesting so I know it's sort of been touched upon but I, I that was what I was going to ask I guess if that makes sense I, I take that hand gesture to mean me first Richard um I, I would say I mean it, it's going to be different in different parts of the country and, and so Dundee has a somewhat limited field of applicants for any given job. Um, uh, and we here, and I would say probably in Scotland, we tend to look for people who want to split between a cl clinical and a teaching role, because we feel that that gives people some legitimacy. Um, we wouldn't look for a PhD in, in teaching, but we would definitely look for evidence of some understanding of teaching and learning that was beyond I have been taught myself, um, which I would say is probably a shift in the last decade. And, and there's reasons for that. So the GMC have a formal structure for 
um, recognition of trainers in postgraduate world, and there is a similar one for undergraduate, although it's applied differently in different places. Um, for research, there is absolutely, if you want a research job, there is no substitute for the elbow grease of getting involved in research, you know, from the ground up. It, it's, it's not, it's never going to lose that hierarchical approach. Um, and that's basically because research is a, an endless filter, as far as I can see. And it only, uh, apologies to anybody on the call who has a successful research career or indeed an unsuccessful research career, but it's it's always struck me, at, you know, I've been in and out of it several times and, and have many friends and family who have similarly, um, endlessly selecting for um, a level of commitment beyond uh, most what is humanly possible for most people so I mean I'm not gonna lie I do teaching because it's a nice way to do really wonderful and interesting stuff without being stuck with the awful miserable grind that is research I, I totally agree but I think the way um, I mean the thing is if you have lots of applicants you're gonna have to filter some way and I think the challenge is, um, you know, certainly uh, places I've worked at, PhD is going to be an easy way to at least filter. But I think if you can sort of build up some of those relationships and sort of get known, go and do a few guest lectures, you know, speak to people before you apply, I think there are always around that. But I think it is a little bit potluck. Oh, uh, uh, thank, thank you very much. And uh, uh, thanks to the speakers for uh, two uh, fantastic uh, presentations. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, one is perhaps um, uh, following up on uh, Richard's comment about, uh, I think he used the word identity and, uh, you know, trying to find a balance between so many different um, uh, aspects. Um, so my, my, uh, uh, particularly the point about um, the challenge that you uh, face, Richard, in terms of splitting your time between your frontline consultant role and the teaching role, it, it sounded to me as if, um, you know, you wanted more time than was uh, effectively on offer and you had to negotiate down to 20% of the frontline role, if I understood you correctly. Um, so my question there is really about um, whether this is an issue that needs to be addressed, particularly in public health, um, because uh, it seems to me, I may be mistaken, but it seems to me that in uh, other uh, medical specialties, there are these established positions that are joint appointments and usually 50-50. Uh, you know, sort of clinical academic appointments, but there are very, very few of such in public health. Uh, so just your view on whether, you know, there's now a need to formalize these kinds of um, uh, balanced uh, clinical academic roles, whether academic in terms of research or teaching or indeed a blend of the two. So that's my first question. Second for perhaps more for Ellie uh, and um, is, um, just wondering, particularly, Eli, congratulations on your new role as head of the, uh, the MBCHB program. My question there is, what has your experience been as um, a public health specialist uh, taking leadership of a program that is um, predominantly clinical? Um, I think um, uh, Richard also is in a similar role. How, how do you find that? I mean, uh, for a medical school, traditionally, it would be you know, sort of a clinical uh, lead, but uh, how, how has your experience been? How have you been accepted? Any challenges in that respect? Thank you. So shall I just go very quickly first? Um, I think this, so I always pondered why on earth is it that academia and service seem so separate in public health? Because it makes no sense. You're in front of a computer both 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 halves of the day. Um, so I would always have thought that it would be connected. But I think on reflection, I think there's sort of, um, I guess, two things going on. I, I think, first of all, the um, the connection, if I'm being totally honest, of research uh, that academics do to what we deal with on the front line, at least at local level, is so disconnected that actually the two things don't really overlap. And the way that the journals and impact factors and everything else is dragging you, no one's particularly interested in publishing applied low end as they might describe it research that looks at local areas and then you've got the whole research infrastructure which is a nightmare in terms of ethics and all the rest of it so so i think that's kind of probably one area it's very difficult to manage the political um exigencies of a service role and still actually manage to to build that time for the academic bits that you're going to be measured on which i think is the other bit but the second point i'd make would be 
um, as Ellie has already alluded to, that fracturing of the NHS arrangement and going into local authorities, um, local authorities don't understand research. Now, there are the HDRCs. I've been out of that for a couple of years, so um, I may well be wrong on that. But local authorities don't get research. They don't know why they're involved in it. They don't want to share their consultants. Um, and then on the university side, um, when I was being recharged uh, from, so I'm employed by the university and I was being recharged with a local authority paying the university, um, the sessional rate the university was charging was just off the charts crazy. Um, so I think it was something like twenty-five to thirty thousand a session um, in terms of the recharge. So um, I, you know, everything is aligned not to do it. Interestingly, my 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 re replies probably in some ways echo how different things have been in Scotland, um, and and so the answer to to some of the questions is that it's been much easier for me. In fact, I have an advantage over other clinicians because all of my work is in front of a computer. And so I'm sat here right now with both email accounts open. So it doesn't matter where the query comes from. I can reply to either as quickly, um, which, which has given me a, a competitive advantage over colleagues through the years. And I think the strategic approaches of public health the, the planning, the emphasis on evaluation. Nobody else in, in the, cl the clinical world really seems to understand what evaluation might be. It, they, you know, they were, let's do it and then see if it works is the end of it. And no definition of what works comes up in advance. Um, so all of that I think has really helped. Uh, and then the other side of it I think is because I am not from any of the big specialties, I'm an honest broker. So, I am, yeah, yeah, yeah. I am able to say, you know, let's look at what this needs at a, a top level. Let's take the end product and work backwards. And, and that's how we've done our curriculum design, actually. We've said, you know, we know we're really proud of what we get at the end. Let's go back from there and work out what the important bits that make that up are. And it's not about it needing lots of surgery. It's not about it needing lots of biochemistry. It's about where we get at the end. That's been really, really valuable. And the other bit is, I think, um, I'm still cantankerous and snippy when I want to be, but um, I am probably far more experienced at attending and chairing meetings with conflicting agendas and with difficult individuals than most of my peers, including, I would say, heads of, of school elsewhere that I work with. Um, and, and so perhaps all of those things have made it um, it's, for me, it's always felt like an enjoyable thing that was almost public health, but not quite. And I think they, they, they overlap so much that it's really felt like a relatively easy transition. Uh, and and I've, I've, like I say, I've felt like I've had a competitive advantage over other people quite often. Um, but on the other hand, on the assessment side, I never know the answer to any of the clinical questions. Every clinician, clinician will be sitting in the room going, oh, yeah, that's barn door, you know, glomerulonephritis with extra waddle on top. And I'm going, I, yeah, if you say so. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. Thank you very much. In, I think we are already overrunning. And thank you, Ellie and Richard, for staying to answer the questions afterwards. I think if anyone wants to ask any further questions, I was going to offer that they can contact you directly by email, as that advice can be very useful. I think the main outcome of this workshop was that we don't need to be disappointed by the lack of um, approval, consideration, reputation for education and teaching it is still a very worthwhile career. And it can be rewarding to get um, the feedback from your students, as Richard was saying, even when it's online and then when you finally meet them in person. It's that, that feeling that you are actually training the next generation of public health professionals, not just in this country, but also reducing inequalities because in many low-income settings, they don't really have the degree of um, or the quality of education that we can offer here. 
So thank you very much to everyone who joined and also for staying a bit late. We'll have the recording on our website um, published very soon. Thank you very much.